Hello and uh, welcome to its live. Uh, my name is Krzysztof Konkol and I'm a solution architect in PGS where I've been working for 10 years. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to be talking to you today about the cloud cost optimization. Uh, okay, so it's not uncommon to meet the companies that uh, overspend in the cloud uh, by oversizing the resources, by uh, not using the right tools for the job. And uh, there are a lot of white papers around the internet where you can read about the good practices and uh, where you can read about things uh, regarding how to spend less, how to uh, right size the things, how to use the good technologies. But that's only the one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is usually omitted. Uh, and uh, using my experience uh, in the cloud, uh, I would like to give you a little bit of tips uh, where you can, uh, how you can look at uh, cost optimization in the cloud. So let's jump right in. Uh, first of all, I would like to cover some basic cost optimization strategies because they are widely known and, uh, well, I will not spend a lot of time to, uh, to speak about them. You can find a lot of informations, but th this is just the basics, the basic things that uh, will allow us to discuss that a little bit further. So first of all, what you probably have to do is to optimize your resources. For instance, you have to select the appropriate size of your virtual machines, your EC2 machines, uh, so that you are not using you are not using uh, uh, large machines when you need the small ones. Uh, second thing is uh, you can use the purchased uh, you can purchase the reserved instances or even spot instances where appropriate to further um, save uh, your money and and the, well uh, make your bill smaller. You can also think of scheduling on of times for your machines. There are a lot of situations where you actually need these kind of uh, your, your resources only in the given period of time. For instance, uh, some development environments can work from nine to five uh, and uh, you can, by turning them on and off uh, at the proper time, you can save a lot of money. Uh, you can also release uh, unused Elastic IP addresses uh, while the, well, w because the Elastic IP addresses are only paid where you are not using them. So you can have only a couple of them and then the saving is not uh, huge, but it's quite a simple thing to uh, release them uh, if you're not using them, especially if you reserved a lot of them. You can also delete unused uh, Elastic blocks, Block Storages uh, or another unused resources. That's quite common uh, when some resources were created uh, just for making some experiments and people sometimes forget to delete them, to remove them. And well, the billing might be quite large because of these unused things. Well, the next layer of thinking about cost optimization is thinking about how you would like to uh, develop your uh, application, how you would like to manage your uh, workload. Uh, for instance, you can uh, take the serverless uh, approach or use uh, managed services or use both of them at the same time. Uh, this is quite important because serverless approach allows you to scale effectively. Mm, you don't pay for the, uh, for, for the resources if you are not using them and you might pay uh, quite a lot if the traffic is high, but you know, when you're paying a lot for your serverless resources, it means that your applications actually uh, very often used. So the costs are, uh, at, at, the, at this moment, the cost is uh, not your actual challenge. Uh, however, using this kind of uh, approach uh, requires you to think of what actually can be made serverless. And uh, mm, for instance, you can also use managed services uh, which uh, actually allow you to store, to save money, not only because of uh, the price of the resources, but also because you are basing on the shared responsibility model of AWS, which means that you can limit your security concerns um, and you can uh, save money on your IT labor to take care about things that you actually don't have to care when using managed service services. 
And of course, uh, there is one thing which is very important uh, for managed services and serverless services um, that uh, these kind of uh, resources, these kind of services allow you to experiment quickly and efficiently. This is very important uh, when you would like to create something from scratch and you would like to just check a hypothesis, you would like to check and verify your approach if it's useful or not, uh, then you don't have to spend a lot of money for uh, virtual machines. You just have to create a, a simple, for instance, Lambda function that will uh, allow you to verify uh, how, how that works and if this approach is actually uh, valid for your uh, business concern. You can also use uh, AWS tools effectively. Uh, there are a lot of tools that allow you to uh, verify your verify and improve your cost uh, efficiency in the cloud. For instance, you can use Trusted Advisor. You can use also Cost Explorer that will let you know what are you spending uh, for in the cloud. You can use your budgets to AWS budgets that uh, allow you to uh, be alerted when some uh, level of cost is uh, um, crossed or, or ex you, you spend more than, than you actually assumed. You can use also a cost usage report, you can use billing and all of these tools that allow you to actually know what you're spending for. But let's speak about some typical use cases um, where you have to uh, consider these kind of uh, costs and how these typical use cases actually might change your perspective. For instance, let's try to focus on AWS S3. Uh, you can try to s save money on the object storage and you can in introduce your intelligent tiring. You can use lifecycle policies to move uh, the resources to, to the objects from the tire to the tire. You can utilize the Glacier, which is a very uh, inexpensive solution. But the thing is, you have to ask yourself how much uh, resources actually you store in S3? How many objects? Is it terabytes level? It's a petabyte level? Uh, because the basic pricing for S3 is about uh, a little bit above two cents per gigabyte per month. This actually means that you, if you store um, one terabyte in, in the cloud, you are spending something like $20, uh, $20 if, if I calculate correctly uh, per month. Does it mean that implementing all of these things to automate moving these uh, your objects from the tire to the tire is worth saving this $20 per month? Of course, if you store petabytes, it might be worth that. But if you store less, then maybe it's better to stay on the basic uh, S3 storage layer uh, and not take care of that too much and focus on different things where you can actually optimize your cost. For instance, you can think of a containerization. Containerization is just a widely known technology. Um, many workloads are moved to containers, to Docker containers especially. Um, there are a lot of tools that uh, support containerization, which are native, which are managed in the cloud like ECS or EKS in, uh, in Amazon. Um, but, and usually, well, usually it's a, uh, very good idea to go to containers. This will allow you to use the resources effectively because you are not running a single application on a sing or a single workload on a single virtual machine. But on that one virtual machine, you can place many applications, many services uh, in, in using the uh, Kubernetes approach. For so for EKS, uh, for Fargate approach, so on ECS or EKS on Fargate, you can use even more elastic approach where uh, you actually don't care about the virtual machines created under the cover. You just pay for what you actually uh, provision. But the thing is, how you orchestrate these things? How do you maintain it? How, how can you maintain this effectively? How do you build and uh, release the complex projects? This requires knowledge and experience, and this might result in a, to the situation in a situation where you actually spend a lot more on the development process while saving the resources cost. 
at the same time. So you have to consider, is it a valid approach for your project? Is it a small project? We're provisioning the container, uh, the containers and the container orchestration in the cloud is much more expensive than uh, much more expensive or the, the workforce or the effort to create these kind of things is much more expensive than the resources and the savings uh, themselves. Uh, if you go one level more and uh, one level higher and uh, you think not about the containers, but you think about going serverless, this might be also valid. This is usually a good thing when uh, you would like to have an endpoint, for instance, in your application, which have, has to scale effectively, uh, not being uh, sensitive to spikes um, and being uh, flexible, uh, as flexible as possible. Uh, this is a very good approach for some cases. And, uh, well, there are a lot of applications which are truly serverless uh, as a whole, but you have to consider who will develop it. How do we learn the technology? This is a kind of different approach than the typical and the, the usual conventional uh, workloads, even on containers. How do we manage the complexity? And you have to consider the risk about the vendor lock-in. This is not something that goes uh, without the price that comes without the price. This is something that you have to consider and uh, something that you have to uh, actually make an analysis of. Uh, is it a valid approach for your project or not? You can also think of the optimizing and autom automating resources. These, these things usually go uh, come together. So whenever you automate your workloads and your deployment processes, you also try to automate and optimize your uh, resources usage. This is uh, a very good approach. Well, automation is most often a very good idea and it allows you not only to uh, optimize your resources to be cost efficient, but it also allows you to uh, avoid human errors, which can also be very costly. Uh, but to introduce these kind of processes, you have to be consider you, you have to consider the cost of introducing that into your organization and into your project, because you have to make you you, you have to provide uh, the people that can automate that. You have to consider the so-called DevOps cost, and it's of course super tr attractive in the cloud because the resources can be created and deleted uh, in a very efficient and and easy way. But what about the cost of the people that will develop it? And usually it ends up in, in a situation where you have your developers, but you have to have a DevOps team that manages the workload on the cloud. Of course, you save money at the same time uh, by avoiding these human errors. You probably save money uh, on having your own uh, data center to store your on-prem uh, workload. Well, so it depends. It has to be carefully considered and not only watch, looking at the cost effectiveness, but also at the uh, IT labor costs. And this is uh, one of the typical scenarios which I like uh, mostly is about strong security proce procedures or processes in, in a company. Usually when we try to start in the cloud, we are thinking uh, about uh, two things. First of all, we are uh, very satisfied, we're we are trying to use as much of the agility that the cloud provides as it's possible. But also we are thinking about the security. This is not our data center, this is the cloud. So we have to provide some procedures that, for instance, allow you to avoid the situation when one of your employees or one of, or some attacker from external world will create uh, uh, the resources that you actually don't want to have and don't want to pay for. The typical cases are when the attackers create some EC2 machines to, uh, for instance, to dig the cryptocurrency. But you have to consider the security procedures also as potential blockers for your productivity. Because the developers or the DevOps team uh, could uh, have to create uh, some kind of uh, workload or to deploy something to the cloud, but at the same time, they have to wait two days for uh, someone that is available or able uh, or privileged to give them some additional permissions to create these kind of things. Maybe it's 
important to validate if these kind of procedures are valid on the dev accounts. Maybe you have to use not only the uh, straightforward uh, security limitations like this person has the ability to, ability to create these kind of roles. This person is responsible for managing these kind of uh, resources. But maybe it's valid. It's important to uh, create also some permission boundaries and allow the people to create EC2 machines, but only at a given size. Uh, maybe it's important to uh, think uh, again uh, about your security procedures to provide you the security that you want to have, but not to block the development teams for using the cloud agility uh, at its best. So where actually the real cost is in the cloud? Uh, we are speaking usually about the total cost of ownership. Yeah, the total cost of ownership means that we, it's the sum of all costs involved in the cloud and not only in, in the cloud, this is just a general term, but we are speaking here about the AWS cloud. So let's focus on that. So total cost of ownership is the sum of all costs involved in the purchase, but also operation and maintenance of a given asset during its lifetime. This also means that we are trying to expand this uh, definition, uh, not only to the resources that are provisioned in the cloud, but also to the workloads that you are you want to uh, run on the cloud. Uh, that's why I spoke a lot of uh, the uh, development cost, a lot of uh, different things, and I try to summarize that. So on the left hand side, you have the things that you actually have to consider when thinking about the resources and the things connected with the resources uh, in the cloud, but also with the people that have to provision these resources. Like you have the server costs, uh, you have the storage costs, of course, connected with the assets that you store in the cloud and also the databases and all of these storages that, that you provision. You have the network costs because you have some network traffic that you have to handle for instance, if you go out of your virtual private cloud in in in, in AWS to uh, to use a managed service, you have to pay for the traffic. You have to consider all of this. You have a software cost because sometimes you're using in the cloud uh, the third party software that you have to pay for just just buying a license or something like that. You have to consider the IT labor costs, which means that you have to have your sysops or devops uh, on board uh, which allows you to run these things and manage these things uh, these resources effectively you have to consider also the planning cost but these things are usually typical for the cloud and for the on-prem data center or for any other way of uh, um, hosting your workloads what do you actually gain in the cloud it's first of all you are able to quick prototype things. This is very important. And uh, as of my experience, this is one of the most important uh, things and my, my most important advantages of using the uh, cloud that you are able to create your resources quickly, effectively testing it and then killing it when, whenever you uh, don't need it anymore. You have a limited risk because of the short responsibility model. Uh, so you limit your security concerns. You don't have to, for instance, take care of your bare metal servers because you are not managing, managing them. You don't have to decommission them and buy new ones. You have the agility, which is, of course, connected with quick prototyping, but you're quite, uh, you can quite dyna dynamically change your uh, workloads. You can increase or vertically scale your resources. You can horizontally scale your resources whenever there is a need to do so. You have this shared responsibility model, which I mentioned uh, a little bit before. You are you have a lot of tools that provide you uh, the way to govern to make a more efficient governance over the cloud resources, and you have a lot of knowledge in the cloud. You have a lot of knowledge in the internet about the resources of the cloud. This is not just like closing in your data center and uh, using your resources, which uh, might be uh, provisioned in in a very untypical unusual way in the cloud you're using a usual uh, a typical solutions uh wide, widely known tools so there is a lot of knowledge that you can use but you can you have to consider some more things in the total cost of ownership first of all the development cost maybe if you're using serverless or 
um, uh, or uh, containerized approach, the development cost goes higher. So saving your money on the on on the one hand will increase your cost on the second one. On the, on the other hand, uh, you have to consider the automation cost. You have to provision things uh, on your own and think about the complex deployment processes, which actually result in a more robust uh, uh, resources provisioning process. But usually, this is a cost that you have to consider. You have. Uh, the knowledge cost, of course, there is a lot of knowledge on the internet, but you have to gain it, you have to get it, and you have to train, uh, which is the last point here, you have to train your uh, IT labor to be able to work effectively in the cloud, which is, uh, well, at, at the very beginning, it might be quite difficult. You have to, of course, uh, also consider the legal issues like connected, like things connected with GDPR limitations, and uh, the things that you have to provide, for instance, when you are speaking about privacy um, of uh, your customer's data uh, in the cloud, this might be also something that you have to consider when moving to the cloud. So just to summarize the total cost of ownership and the things that I wanted to, um, to, to discuss uh, today. First of all, do not focus on the resources cost only. This is just one point in your bill and this might not even be not the biggest one. Don't forget about the human cost, the knowledge and experience cost. Don't forget about the challenges with deployment and automation processes. Don't forget about the potential risk of using new technology. This is also important. And the vendor lock-in. You have to be cons you have to be aware that if you once use the managed services in the cloud, you might not be able to move to another cloud, or you might not be able to move back to your data center. Uh, effectively without refactoring, without rewriting your application from scratch. But of course, there are a lot of uh, advantages of using the cloud, like agility, the possibility of experimenting, uh, the shared responsibility model, which allows you to be a little bit more secure, uh, that uh, you, you have to consider also the elasticity and resiliency uh, in your cost analysis. This is not something that you, uh, have to avoid or you you, you are uh, you, you want to avoid uh, in your cost uh, effectiveness analysis and uh, so basically thanks thank you for your attention and uh, for this presentation and uh, uh, we now have something around uh, five minutes for additional uh, questions and I'll try to answer all of them and if you have some additional questions, just write them down, write them uh, in the chat window, and I'll do my best to answer all of them. Uh, okay, so uh, I have the questions. What tools do you most do you use most often to understand the cost of your infrastructure? Well, there are a lot of tools uh, like Cost Explorer, uh, but uh, most often uh, I use the basic tool, which is a build drill down. Uh, this will allow me to uh, see where the real cost is because in cost explorer the first site you might see for instance that the ec2 machines is something like 25 percent of your bill while the less the, the 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 rest of the things are i don't know 60 or 70 and you have some uh, additional costs connected with the tools that you're using but the build drill down will give you the good insight where the actual cost is so you might see that in the 60% of your bill is the rest of the uh, resources, but you might see that uh, S3 is something like, I don't know, 1% of your bill. So you don't have to uh, focus on that position to, uh, to make it cost effective. Maybe uh, um, focusing on EC2 or RDS uh, is the better way to, to focus. So build drill down is, is my preferred tool. Uh, okay, the next question is what is needed to automate the process of creating and uh, managing the infrastructure? Well, you need a DevOps on board, this is for sure. Uh, and you have to select your tools. Uh, uh, well, there is a lot of knowledge around that uh, needed in, in the team. Sometimes I meet the, well, um, the statements that DevOps is just a culture, so everyone needs to uh to be aware of these things and be able to provision but actually uh and manage these uh, resources but uh, 
Mm, the thing is that the DevOps knowledge is a very wide area of knowledge. There are a lot of tools there. So you probably have to have uh, in your project a DevOps engineer uh, that will be able to handle all of these uh, tools and uh, mm, make a plan and the right plan to automate and focus on the right things. Uh, so the first of all, knowledge or a person that knows how to do it. And the second thing, the tools. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions uh, right there. Um, so once again, thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope uh, you find that the, the insights I gave you useful and you'll be eager to try them out and uh, on your own in your infrastructure, in your uh, cloud uh, workloads. Uh, okay, uh, there is one more question. How long it take to help an organization understand meaningful savings? Well, <laughs> this is just a general question uh, which might not be answered in a simple words. Uh, but you know, you, you gain the knowledge by experience. And uh, what I did at the first um, stage of creating uh, the workloads in the cloud is just I observed the build drill down almost every week, just to understand where the real cost is, where I can save money for my customer. And uh, then I learned how to plan the uh, future savings. And then I tried to use this knowledge to architect a good solution for the customer to first of all uh, make it use usage uh, make, make the right use of the uh, cloud resources and uh, on the second hand uh, on, on on the uh, additionally to save some money uh, if it's uh, possible but I always focused on the effectiveness of using the resources which is not always connected with the cost. OK, so whenever you have some any additional questions, uh, don't hesitate to to to, uh, to contact me for a chat and I'll try to uh, help you with all the things related to the cloud. Uh, thanks for attention uh, once again and uh, have a nice rest of the week.